Good morning, Virginia. This is WGFW 88.7 on your FM dial, Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is 9.15. This is Storytime, brought to you by Safe Haven Ministries. I am your host, Brother D. As always, let us begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We are grateful for our many blessings, the first of which was that we woke up this morning. Father, we ask that you be with those that are traveling today. Please keep them safe. Father, we have many friends and family who are having health issues, other problems. We ask that you reach out and touch them with your Holy Spirit. Touch them with your healing hand. Thy will be done. Father, we are grateful for all that you've given us this day. Now open our hearts, our minds, and our eyes as we bring forth today's stories. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Duh, brother D, what are we going to do today? What are we going to do today? Calm down, dog. You know we got chapter 10 of Spotted Boy and the Comanches, Break for Freedom. Duh, yeah, yeah, Pastor Brian's back. He, he's, he's, a, he's a lot stronger. He's still not out of the woods and still needs prayers, but he, he he's working on getting everything recorded for us. That's right, dog. But first, we're going to talk about light in their homes. Duh, wait a minute. Light in whose homes? Well, it was the occasion of the ninth plague of Egypt. Pharaoh and his people had resisted God in spite of the blood in their drinking water. Frogs in their bed, lice in their hair, flies in their face, the death of all their cattle, boils on their body, and locusts that ate up everything green left after hail had shredded their crops. Duh, sounds like Pharaoh was a difficult man to convince, brother Day. That's right, dog, and in the end, even after he'd lost his firstborn child, Pharaoh still pursued his wicked course, and he lost his army in the Red Sea. But on this day, darkness covered Egypt. Now, just what is darkness? Duh, oh, I, I don't, uh, uh, you're going to have to tell me, Brother D. Well, it has no definition other than a, as a comparison to light. When you define darkness as the absence of light, you can't turn that statement around and say that light is the absence of darkness. Uh, yeah, that's because light has substance. That's right, dog. We can divine, define it as something real. Because light is a physical result of the release of energy and the transformation of matter. But darkness, on the other hand, is nothing but nothing. Light is the most obvious result of God's creative power. That's why when the Creator arrived on the first day of creation, there was light. Wherever God is present, light is also present. Because we live on a lighted planet, we take light for granted. So when Pharaoh sat in darkness for three days, God was trying to tell him something. Duh, yeah, but he still wasn't really listening, was he, Brother D? I, no, he wasn't, dog, and we don't know how God caused that darkness, but we have a hint. When Pharaoh's army came after the Israelites who were camped by the Red Sea, the angel of God that went before Egypt in the cloud-like pillar moved between the two camps. And as scripture tells us, that cloud was darkness to the Egyptians and light for the Israelites, just as it was in the ninth plague. Throughout the Bible, light reveals the presence of God, while the absence of light indicates that his presence has departed. Pharaoh, the Egyptian king, was too proud to realize what the darkness signified. But it is comforting to remember that during all that darkness, the homes of Israel had light. No matter how dark our world becomes, Jesus the light of the world has promised to provide light, and without him there is only darkness, nothing but nothing. Duh, I have a verse for that, Brother D. Exodus 10, uh, verse 23. They, they did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. That's right, dog. You stop and think about it. God had a plan, and that was the thing. Now then, you know what time it is? Duh, yeah, it's time for Pastor Brian, Spotty Boy and the Comanches. Chapter 10, Break for Freedom. Duh, here comes Pastor Brian. Chapter 10, Break for Freedom. Dad was sure he would get no sleep that night, though he knew he needed the rest. But he was still young and he was tired. 
Less than a minute after he had wrapped himself in his buffalo robe, he was sound asleep. He had feared that he would not awaken as he had planned, but along in the night, something awakened him. The quivering call of a screech owl. He shook his head and blinked his eyes open. He, Thad, was the one that should have been making that call. Could it be a real screech owl calling outside Yellow Cloud's village at this moment? It came again. The boy quickly rolled up his old buffalo robe and got the two bridles from under it. Everything else he needed was hidden in the little cave. He crept, huddled on his haunches, to the edge of the lodge, where he had loosened two of the pegs the night before. His heart was beating like a woodpecker drumming on a tree. Yellow Cloud turned over in his sleep and mumbled something, just as Thad was slipping under the edge of the teepee. Thad lay still until heavy breathing inside told him the chief was asleep again. On hands and knees, Thad crawled as fast as he could toward Old Buffalo Horn's teepee to signal Melissa. He kept hoping he would not disturb the dogs. He had gone only a little way when a low growl warned him there would soon be a yammering. He spoke softly to the cur and threw it a piece of venison. The dog snatched it, sniffed in Thad's direction, and then slunk back as though satisfied. As the boy neared Buffalo Horn's lodge and was about to give another Screech Owl's call, he heard it again. It came from the direction of the horse herd and was repeated a minute later. That was Melissa. He knew it. She had beaten him to it. Thad felt a little ashamed, yet... It made him feel better. She apparently had the needed courage. Thad got to his feet and broke into a run, heading straight for the horse herd. In the pale light of the stars, he could barely distinguish their outlines. The guard's fire had died down, and he felt sure that the men and boys were asleep. There was nothing to fear from enemies on a night as cold as this. So they had grown careless. Slip, slipping along the edge of the herd, Thad called softly, Little bit, bullet, come. No second call was needed. Two forms broke free of the herd, their hobbles showing, slowing them up. Thad hurried to them, for he was afraid that they would nicker and waken the guards. He crammed some dry grass into their mouths and whispered endearments into their ears. They nuzzled him affectionately. As fast as he could, he slipped the hackamore on bullets and the bridle on a little bit. He untied their buckskin hobbles and tied his buffalo robe on the back of a bullet. Then he led the two of them away from the herd. His eyes were accustomed to the darkness and he tried to find open, sandy stretches which would muffle their hoofbeats. In a little while, he saw Melissa, a slender figure against the reflected gleam of the starlight on the creek. He felt easier when he saw her, for he remembered that he should have told her to have the cache of supplies ready for loading. It would have saved time, and time was the important thing now. Time to get far away. Thad handed the reins on the horses to Melissa while he hurried to to the hiding place under the willows and took out the provisions, dividing the jerky, nuts, pemmican, and into equal shares. They tied their bundles on their horses. They led the ponies down the creek under the three-foot banks till they felt they were out of hearing of the, of the village. Their teeth were chattering with nervous excitement. They mounted, and Thad gave Melissa some whispered instructions. If we hear those Comanches following us, and they seem about to catch catch up with us, he said, I'll take off in a different direction and circle around so they will follow me. 
but you keep going toward the east. What will become of me if they catch you? Melissa asked in a worried tone. You just stay on a little bit and keep going. Don't leave her for a minute. Stay with her even when you let her graze at night. Keep her hobbled and hold on to her rope. It is a long one. Dad had brought a rope for staking each horse while it grazed. But, it, but I might lose the way if you are not with me, she said. I reckon you might, but a little bit won't. She has escaped from the Comanches four times and got home every time. You won't even have to guide her. Just give her her head. There was something else that worried Thad, and he cautioned Melissa about it. A little bit mighty poor, so you'll have to let her graze some every night. Make sure she gets water when she's thirsty, too. A few minutes, they let the horse horses pick up speed. Thad felt happy and lighthearted, as their preparations for escape were well thought out. They had detailed advice from Sally Buchanan, who knew all there was to know about Comanches. Thad believed. They traveled for an hour at a gallop, stopping now and then to listen for any sound that might indicate they were being followed. It seemed to Thad that Bullet was as eager to get away from Yellow Cloud's village as was Little Bit. They had to be rained down or they would have galloped at top speed. But Thad did not want them to run themselves out at the beginning. They had a long way to travel. He pulled Bullet to a walk as the first gray of the coming day could be seen in the east. He listened. No sound reached his ears, save the whisper of the wind in the dry grass. The fugitives nibbled pemmican and jerky while they watered the horses at a small stream and let them graze for, for an hour. They traveled at a slower speed during the day, stopping at times to listen. At noon, they ate a little and drank at another stream. They traveled until stars came out. With every beat of bullets' hooves, Thad's heart was saying, Going home! Going home! They hobbled their horses and ate a little supper. Thad tied bullets' rope around his wrist so the horse would not stray. Then they rolled themselves into their robes and lay down in the shelter of a heap of rocks and a little draw. Dead tired, they slept all night without waking. At daybreak, Thad woke to see Melissa rolling out of, of her robe. Thad, Thad, she was calling. They're coming. Thad listens and could hear the faraway drumming of hoofbeats. They caught their ponies and mounted. Thad said, Here, Lissy, take my share of food. If they catch me, you'll need it, and I won't. They let their horses out to a run, but in less than an hour, Thad knew that they were going to be overtaken. Run for it, Lissy, he shouted. I'm taking off toward the left. He saw her face as he turned Bullet's head. She was about to cry. He turned to the left and rode hard toward the north. As he pulled... Away from Lissy, he looked back. Little Bit was running toward the east, putting her whole heart into it. Bullet fought the rain for a minute. Then he, too, settled down to a hard run. After a little, Thad could tell that the Comanches had changed their course to match his. It sounded as though they were eight or ten of them. Nothing at that minute could have pleased him more than the knowledge that they were after him instead of Melissa. He was still trying to get away from those yelling devils, but he knew his flight was hopeless. As the dawn spread, he looked back, and there they were at his heels. One of them was swinging a rope while several others had arrows notched, ready to shoot. There were nine of them, 
all young war warriors. He drew a bullet to a halt, thinking it wiser to risk being taken alive than shot. There was a chance, Thad believed, that Yellow Cloud or Little Rabbit would keep the village people from harming him. These young braves were yelling like fiends, and when he slowed down, they swarmed about him. Some slapped him with their open hands, with stinging blows. Others beat him over the head with their rawhide, rawhide ropes. Finally, one swung a doubled rope, bringing it down on Thad's head. He was knocked from his uneasy perch on Bullet's back, and as he hit the ground, everything went black. Duh, we want to thank Pastor Brian, and we're, we're happy that he's, he's feeling better and, and starting to get back to being himself again and all. But he still needs y'all's prayers and everything. So keep him in your prayers. And, and we'll bring you Chapter 11 of Spotted Boy in the Comanches next week. That's right, dog. Now then, since we were talking about light earlier in the program, let's keep going with that theme today. Duh, okay, what 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 you got now, Brother Day? Well, you see, our next text is basically straightforward. It says that even a simple-minded person can gain understanding from God's Word. But if we turn the text around, it would teach another equally important truth. It's just as scientifically correct. The entrance of your light gives words. Duh, okay, that, that, that sounds confusing, hey? Well... Remember, that if it were not for light from some source, you could not read the words on the page. Duh, okay. So, what, what, well, dog, here it is. Light has to enter the picture in order for the human eye to read printed words. And the process works like this. A source of radiation such as the sun, a light bulb, or a fire emit particles of energy called photons. Those photons hit the pages of a book. Most of the photons that strike the page where there is black print get absorbed and are converted into heat. Now, the amount of heat is so small that you don't feel it. Uh, that's a good thing, yeah, concerning how much you read. Uh, well, that's right, dog. But, however, most of the photons that hit the white background bounce back into the air, something that we term reflection. And since light travels in a straight line, the photon reflect the images that are left after the black print absorbs the other photons. The reflected image goes through the lens of your eye, which focuses it on the retina at the rear of your eyeball. The retina then translates that image into the nerve impulses that the optic nerve carries to your brain. Hence, you see the words. Duh, oh man... All that in just a few seconds. That's right, though. Photons of light get organized into nerve impulses that send messages to your brain. You could say that the light teaches you the words. Not only is this the way that you read, it's also the way you see everything. Light arrives and reflects off the surfaces all around you, and it enters your eye to send a message to your brain about what's there. It happens so automatically that we just take it for granted nowadays. Duh, I never thought about that, but John 9, 5 says, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. That's right, dog. Jesus is the light of the world. And you stop and think, when the light from Jesus enters your life, you get a new understanding of things. Duh, that's a, that's a truth and a half right there, brother. Day. That's right, dog. Now, do you suppose it might be why Jesus is also called the Word. The, oh man, the, the Word that was made flesh and dwelt among us, John 1, 14. That's right, dog. And that's one of the many things people need to remember and understand. When you let Jesus into your life, you get a lot of light. The, and Psalm 119, 130. Verse 130 says, says, The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. That's right, dog, it does. Duh, yeah, and there ain't nobody more simple than me. Uh, don't start that, dog. Duh, well, you know what I mean, Brother D. Well, that's one of the things. Now, you stop and think about it. You know, 
this is one of the things you, as you read and study and everything, remember how the light reflects off that page and the photons and just think about it. Evolution couldn't have made the eyeball. Uh, nope, there ain't no way. It took a creator to make the eyeball, especially the way it works and everything. It's a very intricate piece of equipment in our body. That's right, dog. Now then, have you ever stopped to think about God's code of light? Duh. Uh, wait a minute. What are you talking about, Brother D? Well, since light is a form of energy, it's only fitting that the creator should be clothed with it. <clears throat> Duh, I never thought about that. Uh, Adam and Eve were basically clothed with that because the Lord gave it to them before they sinned, didn't they? That's right, though. But here's the thing. After all, Scripture calls him the light of the world. Duh, that, that, that's John 2, 1, 12. That's right, Doug. And we already read John 1, 14. He is the word that was made flesh. Duh, yeah, that's Jesus. And that word is a light shining on our life's path. Duh, and that's what, Psalm 119, 105, isn't it, Brother D? That's right, dog. The Bible talks about the light of God all throughout. Now, what do you suppose God's garment of light looks like? Duh. Oh, man. <laughs> that, that, that's a mind blower right there, Brother D. Well, think about it. If you could see God, how bright would he appear? Would would it would it be different colors? Would lightning flashes emanate from his form? Uh, we can't be certain of the answers to those questions, brother D. But but the Bible does give us some clues. That's right, though. You stop and think about it. When God appeared to Israel from Mount Sinai, the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Duh, that's Exodus twenty four seventeen, brother D. You've been studying, dog. Duh, we 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 trying. We we're getting there slowly. Well, that's it. Then God called Moses to climb up that mountain and meet with him there. Duh, oh man, can you imagine that? An audience with God, the Creator of the universe. That's right, dog. How do you think Moses felt? I have no idea. I wouldn't even know how I would feel. That's right, dog. Moses had been sent, been in the presence of the fire before, when you stop and think about it, when he had met Jesus at the burning bush. Duh, oh, man. Now, John saw Jesus in a vision. And basically, in Revelation, he wrote that his countenance was like the sun, shining in his strength. Duh, Revelation 116. That's right, dog. And from these and other texts, we can deduce that the light that God wears appears like a burning white-hot fire, somewhat like the sun. Now, when Moses asked to see God's glory, the Lord placed him in a cave and covered him with his hand as he passed by, so that the power of his brightness would not destroy Moses. Now, when Moses came down from Sinai, imagine what happened then. I know what happened. His skin of his face shone with that radiant energy. That's right, dog. Exodus 34, 30 tells you that. And his face glowed so brightly that he had to wear a veil to keep from frightening the Israelite people. Oh, man. Just being in the presence of God, he absorbed that light too. That's right, dog. And just think, there's going to be a time coming when we will be able to see that light. And we will see God in all of his glory. And imagine, we'll be reflecting some of that light ourselves. Duh, man, we can reflect that light now if we live our lives right. That's right, dog. But you see, the light of God's coat is so bright that when he returns in the clouds of heaven, every eye will see him. Duh, and Revelation 1-7 says that. Yep, and the Bible also tells us the wicked shall be destroyed with the brightness of his coming. Uh, that's Second Thessalonians 2.8. That's right, dog. This is the same Jesus who said on the first day of creation week, let there be light. And as Jesus speaks, the very elements tremble, not in fright, but with the excitement of raw energy. He is the source of all that energy, and he loves you and me. He loves everybody. And that's the one thing we need to remember. Uh, yeah, and Psalms 104, verse 2 says... 
who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. That describes our God. <laughs> That's right, dog. We serve an awesome God, and we need to remember. There are times when sometimes we we forget, but that's the whole thing. If you want to serve an awesome God, you have to be faithful in what you do. You have to remember that serving God is an honor and a glory. But we need to reflect that light. We need not keep it to ourselves. God, yet as the Bible says, you you they don't light the candle and then hide it under the bushel, do they, under, Brother D? Nope. You're supposed to let your light shine so that everybody can see it. But you're not supposed to do it in a way that shows ego or anything else. You're supposed to reflect God's glory. You're supposed to reflect Jesus in everything that you do. Because when you're doing everything right, and you're not doing it to be seen. You're just doing it because it's the right thing to do. People notice, and they take notice that you're a child of God. And that speaks volumes. You can sit there and preach the greatest sermon anybody ever heard. But if your actions don't match your words, nobody's going to listen to you. Duh, I never thought about that, but you're right. And that's one of the things. I wonder, does, does, does God's coat of light, is it like the rainbow? Is it going to reflect so many colors that we won't be able to count them? I don't know, dog. That's one of the things that won't be answered until Jesus comes back. But when he comes back, you're not going to miss it. You're going to see him coming in the glory. He's going to be sitting on that cloud. But the brightness of his coming is going to make every eye turn to look at him. Duh. It's so good that we got a Savior who, who, who loves us so much that he's coming to get us. That's right, dog. Now then, let us end with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for our many blessings. We are grateful for all that you've given us this day. Father, we ask that you be with our firefighters, our EMTs, the first responders, the doctors, the nurses, the law enforcement officers who work tirelessly day and night to keep us safe. Father, we ask that you be with our military personnel, those that protect us so that we may worship you as we see fit. Be with their families who also serve, even though people do not understand that. Because when these folks are off serving, keeping us safe, the families are home without that loved one. Father, we ask that you be with those that are traveling today. Please keep them safe. Once again, we are grateful for the greatest gift you ever gave the world. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Duh, folks, if you like what you hear or hear on the radio, you can call us at 434-390-5981. That, that's 434-390-5981. That's right, folks, or you can email us at emtx3xl at gmail.com. Again, that is emtx3xl at gmail.com. Folks, once again, we'd like to remind everybody, WGFW is a Christian radio station, and it needs your support. Please send your donations to God's Final Call and Warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia, 24531. Again, that's God's Final Call and Warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia, 24531. Duh, folks. <laughs> Don't 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 put the station's call letters on there. Yeah, d- remember that. <laughs> That's right, dog. But once again, folks, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. We thank you for giving us five years on the air. And once again, we want to thank Safe Haven Ministries, who's been sponsoring Story Time. Once again, folks, this is WGFW eighty-eight point seven on your FM dial, Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is 9.45. We return you to the regular broadcast. Duh, folks, may your week be blessed.